what do you think, you, you signed up for this course, um, what do you think health equity means? Equal access. Equal access, okay. Other thoughts? Equal health outcomes. Equal outcomes. That's a lot harder than equal access, okay. Yeah. Other things? Human dignity. Human dignity, okay. Anything else? I'm sorry? Access to the same quality of care. Access to the same quality, not just the access. And quality of education. And quality of education. So you all really know what I'm going to say. I can go. <laughs> I, I want us to uh, think about health in a very broad way. Uh, if we were talking about grant writing or other kind of things, to me, Health is like the ultimate outcome, okay? It's not, it's not just having your blood pressure right, your weight right, it's, it's happiness, well-being, it's, it's the ultimate broad human outcome for what we do. Um, and if we think about it that way, um, I think we're in better shape. I put this up here deliberately because here are two basic pieces of information that I think you would do well to look at. One of them, the one on the bottom, Closing the Gap in a Generation, is free. It's on the web. It's a PDF file. This is the <coughs> Sentinel WHO report on health inequities and from a world point of view. Uh, and like I say, you can just download it. The second one, uh, unfortunately, costs a little bit of money, Urban Health. But it, it is a series of chapters about health inequity and, more importantly, efforts to change and address health inequity in the Chicago area. So that book has lots of local information, so I just want you to at least know about it. So this question, why are some people healthy and others not, is in my mind the fundamental question in healthcare. This is the basis on which we do everything, even if we're cutting you open and operating on your heart, or worried about how to uh, work with a young mother on uh, taking care of an infant. Um, we really look at one group of people and another group of people and wonder why there's a difference. Okay, that's, that's really what we're doing. Um, this comes from, I'm gonna forget the name of this center, Van Norse something center, I apologize. Uh, um, they work around housing. I, I, I think this is a interesting comment from the, this poet. Rahm Emanuel is building a second city, two cities really, one white, one black, one for the rich, one for the poor, one for private schools, one for closed schools, a new Chicago for the saved and the damned, Gold Coast heavens and low-end hells. It's a biblical binary, despite what the Chicagoland uh, propaganda piece tried to tell us. Now, I don't want to just pick on our mayor because this is a problem all over the world. And it's a pretty clear problem in the United States. So the other thing that I, I'm not going to have time to really convince you of today, but I will put it out there in the very beginning. This is not simply an age-old problem. Okay? It's not simply that we have poverty and poor people are sicker than people that aren't poor, <coughs> even though that's true. This is a problem that's escalating in all areas. You know, on my way here, um, I was just uh, perusing uh, my dull email, which said syphilis went up again. I don't know if it'll make it in the evening news, but you know, <laughs> but that's not a surprise. So wherever we look, we see things happening that should not be happening. So what I want to give you today is a sense of urgency. Yes, it's true that 10 years ago or 50 years ago or 100 years ago, we had health inequities in the United States and they were horrible, but they're getting worse and they're affecting large numbers of people and we are not paying attention to them. So just to remind you, uh, and for those of you that aren't in healthcare, um, since the 1990s in the United States, like most countries, we have a national plan for the health of the American people. It's called Healthy People, whatever decade it is, we're in Healthy People 2020 now. And in that plan, we try to set out real goals that everybody in healthcare is trying to reach in terms of indicators, how many people quit smoking, you know, how many people lost weight, whatever the goals are. So there's a whole process of setting priorities. I want to point out to you that, um, 
point, it won't make any difference. That uh, it started in 1990, but beginning in 2000, we talked about as a national overarching goal, reducing health disparities, which is a language we tend to use in the United States. In 2010, we said, <laughs> I think they may have been smoking something when they said this. We said we were gonna actually eliminate health inequities or health disparities in 10 years, which if you understood what health disparities was, you knew they were smoking something. Um, and this year, so I'm not gonna remember the exact verbiage, this year's 2020 goals talks about um, addressing health equity and trying to strive toward health equity and reducing or eliminating health disparities. So in the national bureaucracy of healthcare, this question of addressing and eliminating health inequities has been a national priority for 30 years. Have you heard about it? Okay. Are we serious? This is the WHO definition. Again, hopefully those of you who are health people know this definition, but for those of you that, that uh, are not health professionals, this is a basic, simple definition from 1948 from the World Health Organization. Health is not simply the absence of disease, but the presence of physical, social, and emotional well-being. One group, and you'll like this edition, one group that I work with, Project Brotherhood, for example, when they use this definition, they've added spiritual. So they'll say physical, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being. That notion of well-being, I think, captures what you all were saying in answer to my first question, that you can't just look at medical services, you can't just look at your physiological measures, that you have to pay attention to those broad components that make up human beings' well-being. Um, and again, I want to remind you, from my point of view at least, um, that the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a critical document that we that has an interesting history that we don't pay a lot of attention to in the United States. This is Article 25, and, and I've put in red what I think are the most important things for what we're talking about today. Everyone has a right, not to the possibility of these things, a right to food, clothing, housing, medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to security. In the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, any other thing that happens beyond their control. Now obviously, not many countries actually achieve this reality, but most of the world takes this notion as their goal. Not only this article, but all the articles in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And let me, let me um, divert for a minute. I don't have a slide on this. Let me go off script for one second. Write this down. Eyes off the prize, O-F-F, -F, off, not on the prize. Eyes off the prize by Carol Adams. This is a historian, a black woman. She argues, and there's a lot of history I don't have time to go into, she argues that after World War II, Carol Adams, after World War II, uh, when Many colonial countries were fighting for their power. We had, we had the Soviet Union and the United States that in fact, the leaders of the civil rights movement were forced to take their eyes off the prize of human rights and divert them to a much narrower concept of civil rights. Check it out, okay? But that's another, that's another course. Okay, I like this definition of health better. Work with me here. Health is a social, economic, and political issue. So right away, it's not about do you have a doctor. That might be useful in some circumstances, but. And above all, a fundamental human right. Inequality, poverty, exploitation, violence, and injustice are at the root of ill health and the deaths of poor and marginalized people. Health for all means that powerful interests have to be challenged that globalization has to be opposed, and that political and economic priorities have to be drastically changed. I like this definition better than the WHO definition. You can Google the People's Health Charter, and you'll find a whole bunch of other documents from sort of a world movement 
moving in this direction. Because this definition assumes a pathophysiological pathway for ill health. And that's really what I'm going to talk about. So here's the NIH definition. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. In the United States, we like talking about health disparities. And we like making it technical and mucking it up. When we talk about health disparities, no one else in the world knows what we're talking about. And our leading health thinkers and professionals are generally speaking unaware of the debates that exist in how do we address health equity. So I'm going to give you a basic, simple, quick lecture. I'm, I'm going to, I'll try to mention where there are fights, but I want to tell you there's a rich debate in arguments about what I'm talking about today. But most Americans are completely out of it. We, they have no clue uh, what's going on in the rest of the world. This is Margaret Whitehead's definition. This is what I call my grandmother's definition. This is a definition my grandmother could understand. It's simple and straightforward. Um, health inequities are differences in health that are not only unnecessary and avoidable, but in addition are considered unfair and unjust. So the first thing you should notice about that definition is it requires a lot of judgment. I mean, how do you figure out what's unnecessary and avoidable? What's unjust to me may not be unjust to someone else. There's no way you can approach this area of human health without understanding a value system and being clear that a value system drives all the decisions and how we think about it. So I would argue that we have to be careful about health disparity. Health disparity or inequality is just a difference. This young man and I have different diseases. We have different anatomies. You know, I'm never going to get prostate cancer, OK? He actually might get breast cancer, but that's beside the point. Oh, thanks. <laughs> it just means that two things aren't equal. Two rates are not equal. That's all it's doing. When we in the United States insist on using the language of disparity, we strip it from the values. And we strip it from accountability. That's why most of the world uses the term equity and inequity. So disparities are observed differences. Inequities are ethical differences. So work with me. Poor people die rich. These things on the left, the disparities, these are just empirical facts in the United States for this moment in history. Poor people die younger than rich people. That's, that's just a fact. Low social class infants have lower birth weight. Another fact. Smokers get more lung cancer than non-smokers in the United States of America at this moment in history. And today, women live longer than men. So let's see what you all think is an inequity. Should poor people die younger than rich people? How many people think poor people should die younger than rich people? Raise your hand. How many people think they shouldn't? Raise your hand. Should not. So according to our definition, you would say that was a health inequity. How about? Should low-class social infants have lower birth weight? How many people say yes, they should have lower birth weight? This is just a disparity. How many people think no? That's wrong. How about should smokers get more lung cancer? How many people say yes? A couple, all right. Probably health workers. How many people say no, smokers shouldn't get more lung cancer? OK. Interesting. We'll come back to that. <laughs> How about this one? Should women live longer than men? That obviously, no one has a problem with that, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, let's go back to the smokers. If someone who's, who raised their hand, if they don't mind, why do you think that that's just a difference and smokers should get more lung cancer than non smokers? Pathologically related? I'm sorry? Pathologically related, you know, you smoke, so the lungs get absorbed. The carbon dioxide alveoli, as you like, it's narrow. All right. So here's somebody with some medical training. Okay. <laughs> All right. But should that be? Should smokers? We're not asking how it happens. Should smokers? Yes. Yes. Because they have a choice. Okay. Um, 
and they choose to smoke. So, yeah, I should call. I, I know probably. So you already know a slippery slope we're going down, huh? <laughs> it is. It is. My husband. My husband's a smoker, and I always say that you know you sh you need to quit smoking. Mm -hmm. It's for your health. It's for your family. It's for the benefits of the community, et cetera, et cetera. And the knucklehead doesn't community. listen to you. And it doesn't, yeah. And, yeah. and so I say, well, I know, you know that what? feeling. You're going to get lung cancer mm -hmm. or something if you continue. So you better stop. Otherwise, you're going to get lung cancer. And so I say, it's his own fault. Okay. Now, this you are expressing the dominant view in healthcare. In fact, I would even argue, since we're here in one of the finest colleges of nursing in the country, you're expressing the dogma that's taught in this building. Okay? Now, let me, now, don't you, you all are people of faith, right? <laughs> so, like, confession, so let me ask, is there anyone in this room who, either in the past or perhaps, you don't have to tell us which, was a smoker. Raise your hand. Okay. How old were you when you started smoking? Fifteen. How old were you? Did you raise your hand? Yes, I did. Seventeen. How old were you? Fifteen. How old were you? Thirteen. Thirteen? Fourteen. Fourteen. Okay. Work with me now. Do thirteen, fourteen, fifteen-year-olds have a brain? Do they have any sense? <laughs> Right, their frontal lobes, we'll go back, their frontal lobes don't work, right? They can't think. Are you with me? Okay. So now help me out. So all you all started smoking when you had no brain. And I'm going to tell you something else. I'm an old doctor. I've taken care of a lot of patients, a lot of heroin addicts. Every addict I've ever taken care of who's quit heroin and tried to quit smoking, they tell me quitting smoking is worse, that's what I've heard. multiple times worse than quitting smoking. Okay, that's what the addicts tell me. Okay, so now think about what we've done here. We've taken a highly, highly, highly addictive drug. And you know, if, if our grandparents were here, it would be even worse. Because I remember when I was a little girl on TV, I mean, that was like, you had doctors saying smoking is good for you. But we'll ignore that for the moment, okay? So we take a highly addictive drug, and if we're going to make money off of it, we trick young people with no brains that want to be grown up, and we get them addicted at 13, 14, 15. And then we say, it's your fault. Now, now be clear. I'm not trying to suggest that personal choice is not important don't, or, or that one is not responsible as a general notion for actions and decisions you make. I'm not arguing that. What I'm saying is, when we look at health and health outcomes, it's not enough to look at what we can personally do. That's important. And that's something we try to work on for ourselves and our loved ones. But we have to consider everything else involved in it. Okay? So it's easier not to hook a 13-year-old if you ban advertising on TV. Okay? Or if you ban it on billboards. It makes it a little easier. It doesn't solve the problem. It's hard, you know, most black women are obese. The majority of black women are obese. You know, that's, that's another lecture too. But, but, <laughs> but, but let me suggest that I, I don't think it's just because black women are weak-willed people and we just like to eat. I do like to eat, but <laughs> there's other things going on. So what I'm, what I'm saying is we can't just look at the individual by themselves. That's important. That's why one person in the family will smoke and one person won't. I'm not suggesting it's not important. But you have to look at the broad context in which this occurs. And in uh, the third world, we addict three and four year olds to smoking. Yes, three and four year olds, who actually usually have more sense than the 13 year olds. But So even things like this is, are murky. And there can be, you can see there could be lots of discussions and debate about what's an inequity and what isn't, okay? So just be aware of that and try to, try to formulate the value system that you're using to make that judgment, make it transparent to yourself and others. So in public health and epidemiology, we measure health inequality, but how we talk about it 
and what we do about it is a discussion for everybody in the country. It's, it's not a technical medical discussion. It's not a statistical discussion. You know, we can, we can do those things to try to figure out what we're talking about, but we can't act as though that's the solution. Rudolf Virchow is the father of virology. For those of you who are nurses or physicians, or if you take any course in pathology, in the footnote somewhere was him, okay, because he's the father of virology. He also was a great guy, and I like this quote, do we not always find the disease of the populace traceable to defects in society? It doesn't mean that we're innocent, okay? It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be held accountable. In fact, we should be held accountable for the defects in society. But I actually believe this. Every disease we have is traceable to defects in our society. And the family context in which people function affects different people differently. Some people end up as crack addicts. Some people end up with college degrees. Okay. It's a complicated interaction of personal factors and contextual factors. Now this, unfortunately, is a reality. And, and I, don't, I don't think I have a slide on this either. So write this down. Institute of Medicine, IOM. Uh, you, can go, you can Google, it might be easier to Google, the National Academy Press. And in January of 2013 was a report. I'm not going to be able to give you the total title, but if you go in and search it, it's called International Perspectives on Health or something like that. I can, if, you, if you remind me, Shirley, I can get you the actual if you can't find it. Um, this is a report. Now, the Institute of Medicine is like our big mucky muck institute. They're not very radical. They just like, they had the consensus. They, they had big, big study sections. And um, they went and compared our health with everybody else in, in the world that's developed countries. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of that later. Um, and basically, what, I, what, what your grandmother told you is what that report showed. Rich people are healthier, you know, period. This is a look at the United States. Uh, from, now, this is from 1975 to 2012. That's not very long in human history. And we're looking at <clears throat> additional years of life expectancy at age 65. So this means people who, are, who already made it to age 65. Okay, that, that includes me. Okay, so, uh, and the bottom diamonds, blue diamonds, are the bottom half of the population in terms of money and wealth. And the squares are the top half. Okay. So look at 1975, all the way over here on the left. You see, even in 1975, the rich folks, and this is rich broadly defined, this is just the top half. Mm -hmm. Most of those people are not rich, but the top half, you can see that they are living longer after age 65 than the bottom half, okay? So the bottom half then, additional years of life expectancy in 1975 was about 15 years. So that means they lived 75, so 80. About 80 was the life expectancy, if you made it to 65, not when you're little, right? I mean, my life expectancy, I, I have a better chance of making it to 70 than my 12-year-old granddaughter, because she's only 12. She got a long way to go. Lots of weird right. stuff could happen. Whereas I'm already 65, so, you know, hopefully I can make it another five years. So, but this, so these people are already 65. Look at 1980. You see how the space between the bottom half, this is life expectancy, between the bottom half and the top half, wow. okay? Something weird is going on in this time frame. That's what I said at the very beginning. We look at these things over lots of time. Bad things are going on now, and we need to figure out why so we can fix them. So, how many of you are pub have public health training? Raise your hand. A few, good, so work with me on this and the rest of you. This, this is a difference between a public health approach and I don't want to say blame the victim, that's one way to look at it, a medical approach, a clinical approach where we concentrate only on the patient. Now you, want, you don't want a doctor, by the way, who doesn't concentrate on you. Okay, so if you have somebody with a doctorate in public health and he, they don't know how to do clinical medicine, you don't want to go to them for your blood pressure. Okay, <laughs> right? But at the same time, you want a doctor that understands these broader issues. Okay. So we're going to look at a case history of Window Falls. This uh, is a real case. 
three-year-old child came into the county's uh, emergency trauma department with severe head injuries, fell out of a window. The mother was at home. The father was in the backyard, saw the child fall from the window. The baby, I, I should change this because usually it's a boy, but anyway, the baby bed was placed in front of the window because it had no air conditioning. And the question here for our clinical people is, what should you do and who's responsible for this fall and which, what's our responsibility as healthcare workers? What do you think? Yes? You have to report it to DC, DCFS. That's true, you do. Okay. Um, but you need to take care of the, the individual mm -hmm. um, and notify the, fam uh, notify the family. Um, I'm sure they already know. Um, so what do you think about the parents? What, huh? What'd you say? I would say that the parents was responsible. Okay. Especially when we're older. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I, you know, if this was my grandbaby, I'd be cursing them out. Yeah. What the hell's wrong? <laughs> right? Okay. Yeah, but if they didn't know any better than to have this bed at that window, you know, it, it's kind of hard because, you know, if you're in a hot house, you're trying to cool off your little kids. And somebody somewhere along the line should have told that person or should have educated the person as to how they could better cool that child without leaving that window that far open. Mm -hmm. So that child would fall out of that window and to take better care of that kid. Now, I don't know who's responsible for that, but if I had a patient at the hospital, I would try to, you know, talk with them about maybe getting a fan or if they could afford a small air conditioner or something and close that window. Right. <laughs> But, but so now we know, I mean, this is a real case, so I didn't change yeah. it ever. Now we, so clearly patient, edu I mean, uh, parent education is a big deal. Yeah. We can do that. Yes. Maybe um, ask if they own and rent the home or the apartment. If Why is that important? If someone provides maintenance for the building or the windows, maybe the window had a screen and it wasn't like something defective with the okay. window. Okay. All right. Will a screen help in this case? No. No, no not okay. really. No. So, so we have a, and you know, you do this all the time. I have a friend just with a little baby. The baby started uh, uh, almost trying to crawl and pull up. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I told the, you know, the parents, you know, they, and these are, you know, they got more degrees than me. The cup, mm -hmm. you know. I said, oh, the ba you should lower, put your mattress in your crib down as far as it goes. They looked at me like I was crazy. And I'm going to tell you something. I saw them a month, a month later. They hadn't done it. Mm. Well, I'm just, you know. You don't know. What do they know about babies? They're still babies themselves. They got graduate degrees. Anyway, <laughs> you know the epi of this, right? This is a seasonal problem in our part of the world. People don't fall out of the windows in wintertime. It's not like people are throwing their babies out the wintertime. If it's, if it's cold, they, the babies aren't falling out the windows. Black and Latino children are at the greatest risk. Is that just because we're dumb? We don't care about our babies. It's worse between zero and four years old. It's overwhelmingly male, which if you've had any sons, you know why. <laughs> and it usually happens in the home. And it takes a nanosecond. That's the definition of a nanosecond. How long does it take your toddler, who can barely walk, to do something stupid and dangerous, and you're sitting right there in front of them? Yeah. A nanosecond, yeah. okay? So, uh, and this has been going on for years, right? Every summer, if you work in an emergency room, every summer these kids come in, and a lot of them die. So this is two different approaches. New York and Chicago. In New York, they passed legislation requiring, they didn't pass legislation saying educate the dumb parents. They didn't pass legislation that said if you let your baby fall out the window, we're gonna put you in jail, because you, for neglect. Okay, they passed legislation that said, you have to have window guards. Screens are useless. A lot of parents think a screen will protect you. Screens are useless. You have to have window guards. And then they did something remarkable in New York. They enforced the legislation, okay? And then they did parental education and all that kind of stuff too. But they, but they really passed the law and enforced it. And they saw a 96% decline in window falls. They didn't talk about if the parents were literate, if they had stayed in high school, if they had a better job, they would do, have better parenting skills, all of which is true, but that, they just passed the law that said, put the guards up. 
period. And if you don't, we're going to make you put them up. 96% decrease. Children's Hospital of Cook County Trauma, they didn't, they didn't have the power to do that, so they did the patient, uh, the parent education stuff. You know how much that, we still had a, there ain't nothing changed, okay? <laughs> and it's not because, I mean, Children's Hospital, they know how to educate parents and talk to parents, but how much money does it take to do that? Okay. Now, if you think government is a problem, then you won't talk about passing legislation, but that's how they solved that problem. This model, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on. I'm gonna tell you what I'm talking about today and what you're doing in this course is complicated. Don't be surprised, okay? It's not like we have one answer or one solution other than get off our butts and try to do something. That, that's probably the simplest thing. So I'm not even gonna spend a lot of time on this because we don't have a lot of time. They're gonna, they're gonna give you this, this uh, slide program, so. I also want to, uh, let me just say one thing. This, that particular thing is from Nancy Krieger. It's called an eco-social model. Uh, the one thing I do want to say about it is that it emphasizes power. You know, there are a lot of conceptual models out there. You have to ask yourself, who has the power and the resources to make changes or to cause trouble? So if you build an apartment building four, five, six stories high, with windows that open and you don't put guards up, you've created the conditions where little kids are gonna fall out the window. It's not an accident, that's predictable. The other thing about Nancy's model that I think is critical is that you have to think about all these levels. We are used in healthcare to thinking about the individual and the family, but you have to think about the neighborhood, the region. There's a big difference whether your apartment building is in Mississippi or Chicago for many reasons. Nationally, what goes on, what goes on globally. She's arguing that you have to consider the life course of an individual. What happened to you when you were two does impact, can impact your health when you're 30 or 50. And the most important thing she argues um, is that these three circles here are the major, not the only, the major classifications around which power and resources are organized in the United States. Class, race and ethnicity, <coughs> and gender. There are other ones, whether you're gay or not, whether you're Catholic or not, you know, there are other things that come into this, but these are the three major ones in the United States and in, probably in most of the world in this time period. This is a framework <coughs> from the WHO where they basically uh, took all the work that's been going around with these eco-social models and came to a world consensus. And let me just tell you right now, the World Health Organization report, the World Health Organization is like the middle of the road consensus institution for public health in the world. They don't, they're not, I mean, I like to call myself a radical. They're not radical. They're not on one, you know, they're a middle of the road institution. So some things I disagree with, but I'm not gonna talk about that today because if we got to the middle of the road, I'd be thrilled. So, um, so they, are they wanted to look at all these uh, um, components and what they emphasize is the structural determinants are what create people's health. We talk about the social determinants of health in the United States. And what we really mean is we think these things influence people's health. I, I disagree with that and so does the WHO. These structural determinants determine, produce health and ill health. And this is uh, their, let's see how many pictures of these. This, this is their model, we won't spend a lot of time on it. Um, it's, it's different, there are a million models. On the right that's in yellow, those are the big broad things. Governance, what are the macroeconomic policies? What are the social policies? Public policies in health and education. These are huge things. So if you have a mayor here and in Philadelphia and in Cleveland that decides you don't have to educate kids anymore, we're gonna close down public schools, you think that doesn't have a ripple effect on people's health? And we haven't seen it yet, it's gonna get worse. When you have a policy like we do in the United States, a macro policy, that says you got to fight and scream for health insurance and pay through the nose, 
your access to medical care is always iffy. In Canada, they don't have that policy. Your health insurance is there. It's not, whether you're employed or unemployed, it's not connected with your job. It's a basic thing that's in the general tax. So everybody in Canada has health insurance. And if you walk into a hospital or you walk into the doctor's office, they're gonna get paid. Maybe if you're from British Columbia and you're in Toronto, it might take an extra week, but you're gonna get paid. That's a different context. Um, the things in the dotted, so these, are the, these things together are the structural components. The things in the dotted lines are things that we're talking about. Class, power, prestige, what your social economic status is. And that little blue box over there that we're not gonna spend a lot of time in, that's where we spend most of our time in the United States. Actually, that's not true. Those of us that care about healthcare spend most of our time there. Most of the medical system doesn't. Those are what we call the social determinants, but those are really intermediary factors. If we just worry about the fact that we have a 16-year-old mom who can't think herself and she's trying to raise a child, that's what we usually concentrate on. We have to help that 16-year-old mom. But really, we better get, pay attention to these structural determinants. How did we get to have a 16-year-old mom in the first place? So this is what the WHO um, um, framework is trying to do. Just some other ways of looking at it. Let me get past these. So I want to spend a little bit of time with us exploring some of these social determinants of health um, in the United States. These are the factors from the textbook definition that influence the health. I actually think that they determine the health of people. Uh, and this is from another WHO organization. These are the prerequisites for health. So you ask yourself, in your neighborhood, did you, how many of these prerequisites do you have? Peace. Well, you know, I got mugged in my neighborhood twice. I live in Hyde Park, you know? Shelter, I see homeless people all the time in my neighborhood. This is not the worst neighborhood in the, in the city. Education, food, these are the prerequisites. You can't even talk about being healthy unless you have these things. You're gonna get this slideshow, don't worry. <laughs> Stable ecosystem. Sustainable resources, social justice, equity meaning fairness. When you have all of this, then you can talk about how do you make it a healthy community? How do you keep your family healthy? So let's look at some things. So how many people here are low class? Middle class, how many people here are middle class? How many people here are working class? You know, in the America, we pretend like we don't have no classes, right? We pretend like everybody's middle class, right? You know, Mitt Romney says he's middle class. And that idiot unemployed plumber from a few years ago during the said he was middle class, you know. Joe the plumber, working class to his bone, I'm middle class, and he was unemployed. I said, boy, class matters. Now, one of the strengths about the United States culture is that we put less ritualistic, well, we put less formal emphasis on class than the old European cultures. Actually, it turns out that we're more immobile than the European countries and, and now, but that's, that, again, that's another story. Um, so class is important. And we should be clear when we talk about social economic status, that's not the same thing as class. When, in this country, when we talk about SES, we, we really are talking about, most of the time, income, okay? Which is one of the worst things you could use because it varies so much. Um, you know, even it, with the same income, you, in most communities in the United States, if you're a minister or a pastor, even though your income may not be that great, you have more status, generally speaking, in your community than if you were something else, a truck driver or something with the same income, you know? So class is not just about income. Prestige and status uh, are important. And in terms of economic status, we're talking about what your income is, what, the, what do we do about poverty? What, what wealth is, which is different than income, Occupational prestige and educational status. We want to look, just look at some of these. Um, so you've seen these kind of pictures before. This is from 1947 to 2010. 
Uh, and it's just looking at the median family income. Because you know, averages, now here I will say this. Averages with income is very dangerous. If Bill Gates walked into this room, we'd be one of the richest, a our average income would be one of the richest in the country, right? Even though you and I would still be poor, okay? <laughs> so the median income is the, is the middle number. 50% have above that and 50% have below that. So, and you can see it's stratified here by race and uh, ethnicity. Um, and that hasn't changed over time. Uh, this is a look at changes in the median income since the, since the Great Recession, 2007 to 2010. The key thing here is, of course, is everybody in the recession, the median income went down for everybody. But some people went down more than others. So again, not surprisingly, black and Latinos and Asians went down a little bit more than whites. But everybody went down. Another thing that we're forced to deal with in the United States is federal poverty level. It changes every year. Um, and I just want to remind you, Molly Orshansky, who is now dead, was a great public servant. And one day her boss asked her to do a rather weird uh, task, which is find out the cheapest food plans from the Department of Agriculture that you could feed your family with in an emergency for a week or two. Not for a month or a year. Okay. So our federal poverty level was already built so that you couldn't live on it for, for a year anyway. That, that, it was in the definition. It's not her fault because they did. It was supposed to be a temporary emergency thing. I don't know if you can read this. This changes every year. So for a family of four, you know, 100% of poverty is 23,500. Try to raise a family of four in Chicago on $23,500. Okay. You can't do it. Okay. So when you hear things like, well, people over 180% of poverty, they can pay for their health insurance. Well, 200% of poverty for that same family is 31, 31, 3. Okay. So even our concept of poverty levels are absurd. Doesn't take into account the difference in housing costs between New York or Chicago or Rockford. Okay. It's an absurd measure. Uh, these are the poverty rates in 2010 uh, by race and ethnicity and age. Um, so again, uh, under age six, way over there on the right, the, the, our babies are, have the highest poverty rates. To me, this is criminal. So when we talk about poor people in this country, we're talking about children, if you just lined them up. And obviously, it varies by race and ethnicity. Also, so the highest rate for children under six, 45.8, 46% of all black children under six are poor. 38% of Latino children and almost 15% of white children. Wealth is different than poverty. That's what you have minus what you owe. Okay, that's, that's the definition of wealth. And that's more strongly linked to social class um, than income, but we don't like talking about it. Here's the median household weight rate. This is just comparing blacks and whites over that period of time. And you can see in 1983, the median wealth of black households was $6,300. The median wealth of white households was 95.7. What's the difference? What, what are we talking about here? Why is there this big difference? The major component. Home ownership. For most Americans, the major component of their wealth is their home. Okay. I'll skip that part. This is some maps of Chicago. Hopefully you can recognize that. From 1970 to 2010. The blue areas, so this, this is where they looked at the median income for Chicago. Okay. And those areas in blue, the median income was more than 20% of the people in those areas had were 20% higher than the median income. The red, more than 20% were below the median income. And the middle was the middle. So look here in 1970. You can see on the far west side, the northwest side, the southwest side, you can see they're sort of in the middle. You're not surprised that in the, this is in 1970, that in the inner city core, the south side, the west side, the north side, black and Latino communities, 
they're below, okay? Now watch how it changes. Watch how the red increases. Look at the difference between the red areas in 1970 and the red areas in 2010, okay? And I think you can see this on your monitors. Look at how the, uh, which you already know, look how the loop gets recaptured by the rich. Look at the difference between 1970, the loop in the, the North Shore, and, and 2010. We, we know this, right? And look at the shrinkage of the, quote, middle. And you know, in 1970, most of that yellow area was white. White people lived there, right? This is the other problem we have in the United States. We have this stuff going on, and we have people believing or not understanding what's really going on. Here's another look that, that says the same thing. The two cities that they were talking about, so we have a Chicago, this is a Chicago, now here I will be political. This is a Chicago Ron Emanuel's topic. That's why he put that Obama high school in that blue section. Screw where you need to have it, okay? He's looking out for city number one, okay? And then you can see the rest of the city. So this is really the evolution into the two cities. This is looking at the metro area, the collar counties, okay? So you see some other blues when you look at the collar counties. Looking at occupation is important. Um, the unemployment rates we know are vary by race and class. Uh, the unemployment rate for black youth has been over 20% for a decade. Uh, these are just uh, rates of productivity. So I, I want to pause on here for a moment because we tell our kids, go to college, okay? Study hard, go to college make it. Now, you're better off with a college degree than not having a college degree. But look how the college graduates are going down just like the, media, the, like the regular workers and the high school graduates. While productivity, that's how much wealth they're producing, is going up. I'll skip some of this. Um, educational status. Again, important. Um, this is, a, this is, data is old um, and it's probably worse now, but it's, to me this is the most disturbing slide, period. And if I had my way, if I could fix one thing, it would be education. So if you're, you excuse me for being crude, if you're dumb and you're born poor, these are IQ, these are IQ scores and the, um, and the wealth of the pa of parents, so these are poor kids with low IQ scores. They stay low. This is from like two years old to 12 years old, all right? If you're a dumb kid, two year old, and your parents have some money in the higher, you suddenly become brilliant. Look how up, far up you go. If you're a brilliant kid and your parents are poor, you get dumber. Well, this is what the public schools do. They take bright kids and make them dumb. And then obviously, if you're bright and your parents have money, you're in good shape. Look at this change, this crossover. College completion rate, I think it's great that some schools send 100% of their kids to college. I want to know how many finish. Um, the, we're in bad shape with college completion rates. These are just educational attainments for the Chicago schools uh, or the Chicago area. Um, I don't want to totally depress you. We talked about that. Um, so basically, this is a good grid to think about. So your individual status, you have to compare it with the community status. So if you're poor and you live in a poor community, you're going to have the worst health. If you're rich and you live in a rich community, you're gonna have the best health, okay? So, so the reality is that there are ways to buffer the impact of being poor. I don't know if I have it in this, in this slide, but um, in this show we'll, we'll talk about it. I think we have to remember the role of structural racism and 
and how much history in this country was spent in slavery. You know, when you talk to kids today, they act, they act like slave, they don't even know what slavery was. But the reality is most of the time that black people have been on this continent was spent in slavery. Um, and the concept of ethnic inferiority is very real. And most of you in health will know these numbers, but this is, this is a disturbing and puzzling thing. A black woman with a graduate degree has worse health outcomes than white high school dropouts. That's what this slide is saying. They have better nutrition, they have better health care, medical care, they have better education, but they have worse birth outcome than white high school dropouts. There are a lot, you know, so one question is why, and the second question is what can we do about it? But it's clearly not simply what people individually do. So there's lots of things going on outside of what those individual women can do to try to have a healthy baby that have an impact on those, on those birth outcomes. This is the same uh, kind of views from the data is old, but unfortunately it's the same relationship, showing that the difference between black and white, which is the column on the right, is smaller than the differences within each group between being educated and not educated. That's why you can still tell your kid they need to finish college, because they're still going to be in better shape, even if they're in worse shape compared to other groups. Um, in Chicago, we have a history of segregation. This is on 31st and Wentworth uh, back in the day. Um, this is what Bronzeville was really like, not what the tourist trap says. This is somebody's basement with just cardboard walls uh, up there. Again, not by accident. This is where people were placed. Um, the attitude that we have toward people, these are from the race riots in 17, 1917 and 1921, were very real. So when you have Trayvon Martin shot, that's what I think of. I think of that picture. I don't care what they call it. Okay. Oh, here are here the slides. So now here, this is these are good. I'm glad I kept these in. These are this is looking at children. Let's go back to children. These are the percent of children who have double jeopardy. That is, they live in poor families and poor neighborhoods. Okay? So you can see not even 2% of white children live in poor families and poor neighborhoods. 16.8% of blacks and 20.5% of Latinos live in poor families and poor neighborhoods. A deadly combination. This is another way of looking at this information. This is just looking at poverty composition for all children, all children, all black children in, in Metro Chicago and all white children in Metro Chicago. So that bottom row where that's red there, th those communities have less than 10% poverty rates, less than 10% of the people in those neighborhoods. Are, so look, most white children live in communities that are not poor. Most black children, not poor black children, most black children are spread out in many communities that are in much worse shape. This is looking at poor black children versus poor white children. So even if you just look at the poor white children, almost 75% of them live in communities that are not poor, less than 10%. And if you included the less than 20%, you're almost up to 100% there, 90% or something. And this is all black children compared to poor white children. So what happens if you're poor and you live in a neighborhood that's not poor? What's different for you? You might, first thing is that the schools might be better. You might have a library that's open and with some books in it. You might have a park, you know? You might have a park with some programs, okay? Things that make a difference in children's lives. Whereas even if you're working really hard and you're in the hood, you know, you may not have a school, you may not have a library. These are maps of the county, uh, Cook County. And again, it's just looking at our ethnic and segregation uh, in the county. Uh, life expectancy by census tract. So when you can draw a map like this where Communities have different life expectancies because of segregation and other resources. This is a problem. This should all be one color. If things were equitable, it should all be the same color. Here's another. This, this is similar to one of the early slides. 
This is looking at average life expectancy for people that make less than 25,000 versus people that make greater than 53,000. That's not a very big uh, gap. But those are the kind of gaps we're talking about. So being poor really does cost you uh, your health. And uh, so racial segregation contributes to concentrated poverty. That's a problem. That's what we have to eliminate. It restricts opportunities that people have. Blacks are five times less likely than whites to live in census tracts with supermarkets. They're more likely to live in communities with fast foods. Black and Latino neighborhoods have fewer parks and green spaces, fewer safe places to walk, jog, bike, and play. In fact, one of the most important things for people in my neighborhood when they talk about the charter schools, because you, you know, the ch not only do the charter schools not teach better, you can't even hardly find out which, one, which charter schools are better than others, but the, what they're really doing is they're trying to get their kids in a safe school. That's what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. you know. so, so they're trying to find a school where their kid might yeah. not get shot. Right. And if he didn't learn right. how to read, that's a secondary consideration. Mm. Communities of color have more exposure to environmental hazards. And as those of you that know in the hood, there's a poverty tax in terms of what you can buy it, it bugs me. You go to Walgreens in the hood and go to Walgreens on the north side, completely different. The foreclosure crisis, you can see where the, the foreclosure crisis hit everywhere. The red is the worst. But this is the biggest loss of wealth for the black and Latino communities in the history of the country, the foreclosure crisis. And it's, if, if we recover, it will take generations to recover from it. So, the racial disparities that exist for all people of color are serious, they're persistent, they haven't gone away, we're not in a post-racial society, and race is still important, even when you consider SES, um, because they're synergistic. These large differences persist throughout the lifespan. Income and class are major contributors, but race also contributes black women and their birth outcomes. I'm not going to talk about it. So even when we look at something like this, this is breast cancer uh, incident rates, how often, how frequently women get breast cancer, and then how frequently women die from breast cancer. Um, and uh, this is in the United States. And you can see through all the racial groups that, for example, blacks do not have a, the highest incident rate for black breast cancer. Whites have a higher incident rate, for example. But blacks do have the highest death rate. They're, they're in yellow for breast cancer. Okay. Let's look at, uh, I like this cartoon. That's, that's me on the table, right? <laughs> that's the problem, you're not a white male. Um, did I lose that? Maybe I don't have it, let me go back here and talk about it. If you look at Chicago data, if you go back to like 1970, the death rate between black women and white women in Chicago from breast cancer are basically the same. If you go to today, the black death rate has gotten much is much higher than the white death rate. Why is that? Why do you think? Better access to care for, um, for the white people. Not just that, but that is important. So this is what happened. Our ability to save women from dying from breast cancer has tremendously increased over the past 30 years. You know, the, the tools, the medical tools that we have. So when we do something like that, that should mean great improvements, but you don't distribute it equally, then what happens is you actually usually, frequently, widen the gap, even though you have more tools to make it better. Because in 1970, if you had breast cancer, we didn't have a lot of tools, and you know, if you don't have, let's pretend we had no tools, then you're gonna die more or less at equal rates. But today, where we have all kinds of surgical and, and pharmacological tools to prevent people from dying, then if you don't have them, you, so really what happened is black death rates didn't change. It's just that the white death, women death rates from breast cancer among white women in Chicago uh, improved so, so a great deal. Now, having said that, let me just also say, that same difference, that gap, is not as big as in New York. Now, white women and black women are the same in New York and Chicago. Well, I think we're better, but you know, basically, biologically, we're the same, right? <laughs> So there, are, there is a way, New York has found a way to soften that gap. Okay. Did they put um, locks on windows? 
they put locks on the windows and, uh, <laughs> and they made sure people could get their treatment for breast cancer. That's what they did. This, this is, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. It just looks at diabetes uh, and this is hard for you to read. So like the bl that uh, blue thing at the very end um, is uh, whites, this orange. Um, you can't even see what that is. The main thing I want, the main reason this is here is for the yellow. That, those light yellow, those are, the smallest one is Cuban, the next is Mexican, and the next is Puerto Ricans. So I, I just want to take a minute and say, when we lump together groups, when we say Latinos are this, or um, you know, Asians are that, we, we don't know what we're talking about. These groups vary a great deal. So you can look for diabetes. The Cubans' uh, rate of diabetes is just like the general population. Now, if you're Mexican, that's a different story. Okay, you have higher rates. If I told you that the black uh, death rate for diabetes was, you know, whatever it is, 10 today, what does that mean? Who am I talking about? Is it the same group I was talking about in 1950? Hmm? No. What's different? Interracial. It's not that much interracial. Immigration. Immigration. So now we have more immigrants from the African diaspora. We always had some immigrants from the Caribbean back in the, in the 50s, but now we have much more. Where do most African Americans live? In our cities. In our cities. Where do most people of African descent with a history of slavery in the Western Hemisphere live? In the South. That's what everybody says? What you say? You shaking your head, Where, what do you think? In the inner cities, city. right? In the city, how about you brother? I say in the South. Okay. How many people here finish high school? Raise your hand. How many people here finish college? Graduate school, okay. This happens every time I ask this question. Do not be embarrassed, okay? Just remember how well educated you all are. But you don't, especially my brothers and sisters, but you don't even know where most African Americans, where most ordinary black people who came over here on the Middle Passage on slave ships live. What language do they speak? Spanish. S Spanish and Portuguese. They don't speak English. Most slaves did not come to the United States. Only four to six percent of the slaves came to the United States. The rest of them went everywhere in the hemisphere. If I'm hanging out in Havana, I look like I'm Cuban. If I'm in Rio, I look like I'm Brazilian, okay? Most black people, African Americans, with a slave ancestry, do not speak English and do not live within the borders of the United States. It's just the divide and conquer arrogance and our poor education system that lets us think this. So we don't know. So if I read an article in 1930 that talks about death rates for black people, I sort of know what that means. Today, I'm not really sure what that means. Okay? And you know, um, I, and I don't, I don't mean this to set up rivalry, but uh, I was reading an interesting study that, that said that almost 50% of blacks who had graduated in the past, you know, 25 years or so, from the Ivy League schools were first generation immigrants. Okay, mm -hmm. think about that when you think about affirmative action. So the main thing we want to remember as we think about health care is we want to pay attention to the lifestyle trap. Lifestyle choices are structured by the circumstances. It doesn't mean you don't try. When a patient comes in to me and they smoke, I try to work with them to quit smoking. Okay, all right? But I understand that how they got started smoking is based on all of these other contextual issues. Um, for those of us that work in care, that's why looking at medical care in an expanded way, in a broad way, is useful. You can't really treat high blood pressure or obesity or asthma without paying attention to what's going on in the community, what's going on in the family. This is what we were taught, most of us, in, in our various schools. Um, so um, in Inglewood, this is one of our Inglewood Health Centers, we started a walking club, for example, on Saturdays 
walking with the clinical staff. When we think about food, if Americans ate tomorrow the way we want them to eat, we would not have enough fruits and vegetables in the country to feed everybody. The reason people eat the way they do is because of how we've structured the agricultural system. We subsidized dairy, we subsidized meat, and made it cheaper. So unless you're an idiot, well, I mean, if you don't have any money, you buy the cheap food, right? You know, anybody that can take chitlins and cook them and act like it's a... <laughs> I tell you, my auntie, you know, my mother refused to cook. My aunties told me, she said, they said, Linda, you don't eat chitlins in anybody's house That's unless right. you trust them with your life. That's right. That's right. But anyway, uh, people that can take chitlins and cook them, you know, you go with what's available. It's not an accident that we eat what we eat. And we have to consider the whole process. Not only what goes on in the table, what goes on with the people who pick the food. It's not an accident that agricultural workers were excluded from the Social Security Act. Because when the Social Security Act was passed, what color were the agricultural workers and domestic workers? Black, that were excluded from the act. It's not an accident. Who is working in the meatpacking factories that they move from Chicago to Iowa? Immigrants, often without documents. It's not an accident. So we set up a food system designed to make money, not designed to keep people healthy. So this is just a look at the, at the price differentials between 1985 and 2000. Fruits and vegetables went up. Red meat, poultry, sugar, fats, and soft drinks went down. If you're walking to school, you may or may not have had breakfast, you got a little bit of change in your pocket, and you're not sure what you're going to have for dinner, the smartest do thing you can do economically is get some pop and some Red Hots. That's the smartest thing you can do. Taste good and make you satisfied. And that's what the kids do it. They don't do it because they're stupid. Right. That's, true. that's what they do. Flaming hots. Flaming hots. <laughs> uh, I don't want to talk about the Affordable Care Act that much, except to say the Affordable Care Act is designed to cover half of the uninsured. That means half the people that are presently uninsured will remain uninsured. And it doesn't cover people who are here legally until they've been here five years and it doesn't cover people who don't have documents at all. It is criminal. And I will say this, I can say this, we taught that young man better. When we sent him off there, he knew damn well a single payer is what we needed. We taught him, right, Shirley? We taught him better. Okay. Anyway. That's okay. So, I want to I wanna move into some of the international comparisons. This is a map, a, a dot map of different countries. You can see we're way over there at the very top. The highest circle is us, the USA, and uh, France. You can see. So on that <coughs> uh, y-axis is the poverty, relative poverty rates, and on the x-axis is how much money we spend on social welfare. So you can see. We don't spend a lot of money and we got a, a lot of poverty. You can see France over here spends a lot of money. They don't have very much poverty. This is not rocket science as far as I'm concerned, okay? We can, we can buffer the impact of poverty. We can do it. Maybe every kid can't go to Disneyland. But every kid should be able to go to the Museum of Science and Industry. When I first came to Chicago in 1966, the Museum of Science and Industry was free. Okay? And when I went there, I was a college student. When I went there, it'd be full of little kids running around acting crazy. Okay? Now, I have to carefully go to the cash station. I'm a doctor. I got to go to the cash station before I take my grandkids there. Now, it's a major investment. It's a very expensive, yes. Yeah. Do they have a free day anymore? I don't know what it is. They may still have, but you know, it's, you know, second Thursday when the moon is full or something, but you know. <laughs> if they want to 
to charge $5 if you don't live in the city or, five, or $10 if you're a tourist, I don't really care. But you know, for, you know, if you live in the city, you should be able to get in free. So, now that, that's a simple social expenditure. What about basic things like this is health care, unemployment insurance, that's what these social, social expenditures are. Because if you don't pay for it on the front end, you're going to pay for it on the back end. Yes, literally. So these are the basic principles that are coming out of the WHO report. I think they make sense. These are the three overarching principles. You have to improve daily living conditions, the circumstances in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. And while these knucklehead politicians try to take my pension before I can even start to collect it, and po folks act like, well, why not? We're the only country that thinks old people don't deserve a pension. It amazes me. Yeah. yeah, they were living too long. <laughs> this is what Sir Michael Merrimont says, who, who is the author, who's the chairman of this report. He says, not only do old people deserve to have security in their old age, to be able to eat and live, they said they should have enough security that they can buy their grandkids a present. Because after all, if you're a grandparent and you can't buy your grandkids a present, what the hell's going on? I think that's reasonable. I think most Americans would agree with that. They may not buy them a pony, but you ought to be able to buy them a present. <laughs> we have to tackle inequitable distribution of power, money, and resources. The structural drivers, the conditions of daily life, globally, nationally, and locally. Now, this is the hard thing. This is what gets you in trouble. This is what gets you put in jail, OK? If you remember your history, when you start talking like this, they don't like it, OK? They don't like it. Now in 1950, some people in this country thought they could just ignore what was going on, ignore the bad things they saw, and they would be OK. I would argue that history has shown that they're wrong, that their children and their grand We are the first. These children that are in high school now, they're going to be the first generation in the history of this country where fewer of them will graduate from high school than in their parents' generation. Think about that. Think about that. We're going backwards. We're going backwards. This is what my great-grandmother told me. She said, white folks will cop knock you down, and they'll try to keep you down. And the only thing you have to decide is how often you try to stand up. That's where we are today. Because this thing is getting worse and worse. So I don't want to scare you. Doing number two is hard. If we do it together, we're in better shape. But if we don't do it, we just continue to get ground to the ground. And then we have to understand what we're doing. Because, you know, we know what's wrong. It doesn't mean we always know how to fix it. I'm open to the idea that maybe there are better ways to educate kids. I, I, I'm willing to look at all that, but we have to do it in an open way and, and evaluate what we're doing and see what works and what doesn't work. And the same thing doesn't work for everybody. In 1963, you, most of you were alive then. Remember what the hell we said. Don't worry about what's on the evening news or what the documentaries say we said. We were there. You know? It wasn't about, I have a dream. That was the speech. It was jobs and freedom, right? It was about power and money. It wasn't about my children or walk hand in hand. That was rhetoric. We demanded in 1963 civil rights legislation that would guarantee access to public accommodations, housing, and integrated education, and the right to vote. And we don't even have a right to vote anymore. We're losing that. We're letting that slip away. That's what we wanted in 1963. We wanted to withhold federal funds from all programs in which discrimination exists. That would close the budget gap if we did that today. We wanted to desegregate all the schools. We wanted to enforce the 14th Amendment and take representation from Congress where people weren't allowed to vote. Take away some of their Congress people. Decrease their vote. And, and we wanted to ban housing discrimination. And we wanted jobs. That's what the march was about, some economic justice, some more. Just the, just the demands that we made in 1963. A Fair Labor Standards Act. Today, less than 8% of all American workers in the private sectors have unions. 
another reason we're in big trouble. So we know that these are the public policy determinants that we need. We can argue about how to do these, but I would say that most of the world agree that this is what we should do. How we do them, we have lots of room to argue. We need to have policies that protect early life, income supports, progressive family policies, ch available child care, invest in quality education in early life. We have to support literacy, public spending, tuition policy, make sure when people get laid off in their 30s, they can go back to school and learn something else. We have to have good employment and working conditions. A minimum wage of 1010 is a crime. Now I'm gonna tell you something. I was taught when you go to negotiate with somebody, you don't start off with your last position. If you, had a, if you earn $10.10 an hour, you'd still be below poverty wages. That's only 20,000 a year. That's not enough. Ask for what you need. And we have to have a, a policy to deal with unemployment. Housing, income and income distribution. It may not be the best solution, but God damn it, take some of the money from those rich people and spend it on some poor people. Spoil me for a while, that's okay. We have to address racism and discrimination in this country. We really do. And we have to understand that a social safety net is critical for any rational society. It has nothing to do with the worth of the people that have to use the social safety net. You have a social safety net so that you can collectively help each other. Food security, obviously health services, we can't even get that right. And we need to have communities that, have, that are real, that are vital, uh, that aren't just bedroom communities. This is one of my favorite co quotes from Dr. King. We're in trouble, it's getting worse. There's not an easy way out. It's gonna take some hard thinking and some harder action. And it starts with people like you coming from the faith community to go back to your churches and synagogues and really stir up the population to say, these are things that are wrong and unjust and we can change them. Thank you.